And they'll go on a short boundary walk and talk about issues about, regarding land use and urban development. Then on the following Monday, June 26th, the City, uh, City Club Citizens Read will meet to discuss the book with David Oates. Details on these events, plus a new Leaders Council trip to the Bull Run watershed are all available online or in your bulletin. We have an upcoming breakfast co-sponsored by City Club and the Portland Business Alliance. Frederick Hitz, who's former Inspector General of the CIA and author of a recent book entitled The Great Game, The Myth and Reality of Espionage, will be the speaker. The breakfast will be held on Wednesday, June 28th, here at the Governor Hotel. For more information, check with City Club. And finally, it's summertime, which means the return of the salons. The citizen salons are intimate dinner discussions in the home of a member with a guest provocateur, all to raise money for the City Club of Portland. Please pick up a brochure at the registration desk and make your reservation soon. Details about these events are in your weekly bulletin or online at www.pdxcityclub.org. If you're on our website, you can also find information about membership, our TV and radio broadcast schedule, and of course, the Citizens Blog online forum. You can listen to today's forum online, or you can purchase an audio CD or videotape. We are so fortunate in Portland to have great citizen or great corporate citizens who help uh, make these programs possible and sponsor our forums. Our quarterly sponsors this uh, this uh, quarter are Kaiser Permanente and Stoll Reeves LLP. Could you please join me in thanking our sponsors? Our program today is entitled, Oregon Free Speech, Too Much of a Good Thing? While few of us would argue that freedom of speech should be restricted, we might have doubts about a constitutional pro uh, provision that protects nude dancing, garish highway billboards, and unlimited campaign contributions. Oregon, Oregon's free speech clause is often described as the most permissive in the country, but why? Is it really possible that in the 1850s, those attending our Constitutional Convention and those pioneers on the murals in the, in the state capitol intended it to be this way? And is it serving Oregonians well in, in the current time? We are so fortunate to have with us this morning two leading Oregon advocates, Kelly Clark on my immediate left and Charlie Hinkle the, uh, at the other end of the table. Uh, to pre on the far left to present their sides of this ongoing debate. <laughs> Kelly Clark uh, and Charlie Hinkle uh, will be joined by Judge Ellen Rosenblum who will be serving as moderator. Kelly Clark entered his uh, career early and served two, houses, uh, two terms in the House of Representatives. He now focuses his law practice public law, representing individuals, families, and businesses before and against the government. About 12 years ago, Kelly began handling priest abuse cases, and he now has a significant practice and reputation representing victims of child abuse, both in court and before the legislature. Kelly is a student of history, law, and philosophy. He's had a lifelong dis uh, desire to study theology, and he's currently a candidate in a master's degree program in theology. He just finished his first semester of New Testament Greek. And for his thesis, he is studying the doctrines of the church in light of the recent uh, child abuse scandals. Charlie Hinkle is a partner at Stoll Reeves LLP in Portland. He's an ordained minister of the United Church of Christ, and he's former past president of the ACLU of Oregon and the City Club of Portland. 
Charlie's taught constitutional law for many years. He began doing First Amendment work in 1975 for the old Oregon Journal. And then when it merged with the Oregonian in 1982, he continued as the new newsroom lawyer doing the First Amendment work. Charlie's handled over 100 cases for the ACLU, including issues involving free speech, the death penalty, aid in dying, obscenity, freedom of expression, and religious liberty. In his spare time, Charlie tends his dahlias and is a devoted fan of ballet. Our moderator today is the Honorable Ellen Rosenblum. Ellen served as a circuit court judge in Multnomah County from 1989 to 2005, at which point she was appointed as a, a judge on the Oregon Court of Appeals. Ellen is, oops, she's a friend, you see, I slip every now and then. Judge Rosenblum is, uh, has risen in the uh, uh, ranks of the American Bar Association, and she has served as secretary of that organization. She's highly, uh, she's highly regarded in the many circles in which she moves. She's been the recipient of the Oregon Women Lawyers Justice Betty Roberts Award for promoting women in the profession, and the Oregon State Bar President's Award for Public Service, and many, many other awards recognizing her outstanding contribution to the community. We are so fortunate to have with us these incredibly talented individuals. Please welcome, or please join me in welcoming our guests. Thank you, Susan. It is a pleasure to be here among so many friends and so many fabulous lawyers and other professionals, people in our communities, legislators, um, many, many people from all walks of life in our community. And I appreciate being asked to participate here today. Uh, I, however, I've already been warned by at least one of our speakers that uh, Although I'm a judge, apparently in this um, context, they don't necessarily have to answer my questions directly. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, in 1982, then Oregon Supreme Court Justice Hans Lindy set forth the framework for challenges brought under Article 1, Section 8 of the Oregon Constitution, better known as the Free Speech or Free Expression Clause. The case was State versus Robertson, and since then, the Robertson framework has been adhered to by the Oregon Supreme Court in analyzing numerous free speech challenges. As a colorful law professor and lawyer, Bill Long, has written, Oregon courts have often sung the praises of the Oregon approach to free speech, and each successive decision implicating Article 1, Section 8 seems to add yet another stanza to the hymn. Though controversial, this Robertson framework has provided a systematic method for determining the constitutionality of laws touching speech in our state. As recently as this past March, with the Oregon Supreme Court's decision in Outdoor Media, Dimensions, Inc. versus Department of Transportation, and since that fateful 1982 year, the appellate courts in Oregon have wrestled with such issues required by Robertson as, does the statute in question focus on the content of speech or writings or rather, does it focus on the pursuit or accomplishment of forbidden results? If it's a law of the former type, is the scope of the restraint wholly confined within some historical exception that was well established when the first American guarantees of freedom of expression were adopted and that the guarantees then, or in 1859, demonstrably were not intended to reach? If so, then it won't violate Article 1, Section 8. Then, Robertson requires us to assess if the law does focus on forbidden results, is it overbroad such that it appears to reach privileged communications? Or, by contrast, is it saved because it focuses on forbidden effects without referring to expression at all? Thankfully, you are not going to get a legal lecture today, certainly not from me although you may think you just got one. <laughs> but in fact, in fact, it is no small irony that a member of the Oregon Court of Appeals was asked to moderate this debate today. Though I wasn't on the court for the most recent spate of cases that have gone up to the Oregon Supreme Court on this subject, it is apparent that great minds can disagree, as the Supreme Court has reversed the brilliant 
lower court decisions in at least three of these seminal cases. Outdoor media, in which the Supreme Court held that the Oregon Motorist Information Act provision requiring a fee for off-premises signs, but not on-premises signs, violated the state's free expression provisions, as well as State versus Cincinnati and City of Nyssa versus Dufloth, decided on the same day last year, in which the Supreme Court disagreed with the reasoning of the Court of Appeals that the restricted expressions, live sex shows in one case and nude dancing within four feet of the customer uh, in the other, and thus the challenge statutes fell within the historical exception part of the Robertson framework. That is, the Supreme Court disagreed with uh, the Court of Appeals' conclusions in that regard. But rather, you are about to hear from these lawyers who toil in the free speech vineyard and who have kindly agreed to debate the issue in this forum. As they present their respective positions, without suggesting that I have any position on these matters, and without directing their debate points in any way, I suggest we, at least for ourselves, try to obtain answers to some of the following questions. Do we want to have a free expression provision that is so broad that it covers things that, like the Supreme Court said in Cincinnati, a majority of citizens in many communities would dislike? Why don't we, like cases applying the federal constitution, leave room for community standards? Is there really any place in a legitimate constitutional analysis for policy considerations and what the average voter likes and dislikes? Is it appropriate for there to be a backlash against the court from the voters when the Supreme Court interprets our free expression clause so as to protect things that a majority of people dislike? And finally, ask the question whether the Oregon Supreme Court has really gone as far as some have suggested. Did the court in Cincinnati really hold that the Oregon Constitution protects live sex acts, or did it just strike down the particular criminal statute involved because that statute was directly aimed at expression? Is it possible that the court is really just sending the message to the legislature that if it wants to criminalize these acts or limit the number of highway billboards, it must do so in a non-discriminatory way? So that being food for thought as we begin the debate today, I will call upon Mr. Clark, who will present his opening argument that the Oregon Free Speech Clause is too broad. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the City Club, thank you for the invitation to speak to you today. <clears throat> Those of you who know the Da Vinci Code will understand the remark made this morning by my law partner, Mark O'Donnell. Mark, who is a Catholic, said to me, you know, if you really want to join Opus Dei, there's got to be a less painful way to inflict self-flagellation than to go and tell the City Club and Charlie Hinkle that we have too much free speech in Oregon. <laughs> I, I don't know yet about joining Opus Dei, but it is true that my answer to the question, too much of a good thing, is yes. If, if and to the extent that Article 1, Section 8 means we cannot solve problems important to ordinary Oregonians. In our examples today, too much money in our politics, too many billboards along our highways, and too much commercial sex in our towns. If and to the extent we cannot address these problems, and if the average Oregonian is told that the reason we cannot do so is because the courts have said free speech prevents common sense laws aimed at these problems, if and to that extent, then both our Constitution and our courts will suffer a crucial loss in confidence, and yes, at that point, we have too much of a good thing. In the few minutes I have today, I cannot attempt anything like a comprehensive review of Article I, Section 8 case law. Instead, I would like to step back and look at the forest rather than the trees. My remarks are in three parts. In the first, I will explore this concern about public credibility. Second is a simplified overview and critique of our free speech case law. And third, I touch on three historic ideas about how to balance free speech with other values that we care about. And finally, I will revisit this issue about the credibility of the Constitution. First, this matter of legitimacy. For a number of years, I have had a growing concern that our public institutions and processes are losing credibility with the body politic. This is not the time to present that thesis in its entirety, but let me just give you three bullets. Since 1994, something like 75% of the initiated constitutional amendments have been thrown out by the courts 
for reasons that I submit seem to the citizenry to be a kind of hyper-technical game of keep away with the Constitution, with the result that I'm afraid both the courts and the electoral process have lost precious political capital with the voters. Second, the legislature, which only a few decades ago was viewed as an institution of real civic leadership, has now lost much of its legitimacy for reasons I suspect we could pretty much agree on. And third, despite the high expectations by the process gurus for vote by mail, voter turnout remains anemic. Those of us who believe in representative democracy should pay attention. There is a growing gap between Joe Citizen and the political establishment. We need look no further than the Oregon land use system to see what happens when real folks finally conclude that the establishment isn't listening. And when they are told that our free speech clause keeps us from bringing the common sense to bear on the three problems of today's agenda, the folks become restless and cynical and disengaged. Now, I am not saying that the courts should become like politicians and take monthly approval polls, but I am saying that we have a precarious and unsustainable situation when the public perceives that constitutional law is no longer, in any sense, in touch with common sense, that is, the sense of the common man or woman. And to my mind, that departure from the common sense began during the birth of our independent state constitutional law in the 80s, when the Supreme Court concluded that Article I, Section 8 does not allow a balancing of free speech with other important values. That is one of the crucial differences between Oregon free speech law and its federal counterpart. We don't balance pure free speech in Oregon. And this I hold to be a mistake. To defend my position, I must revisit some of our constitutional history, which is my second topic. I take it as a given that the Supreme Court was correct 30 years ago to begin to carve out an independent state constitutional law to say that our Constitution has language and meaning distinct from the federal. The court was right as a matter of history, for I suspect that the framers of our Constitution did want it to be our own document. The court was right as a matter of constitutional interpretation, for it took the notion of framer intent seriously. And the court was right by political philosophy, for the idea of states as laboratories Independent sovereign entities is a necessary component of federalism, as was noted early by Madison, de Tocqueville, and others. And I am even willing to say that the court was correct when it began in the 80s to say that the framers of the Oregon Constitution wanted Article I, Section 8 to have broad shoulders, broader even than the federal First Amendment. But even conceding this starting ground, the territory where I cannot go and where I cannot abide is the notion, even from an independent Bill of Rights in a liberty-loving state, that any civil right is or can be absolute, with no limits, no balancing of liberties at all. And in its refusal to balance free speech against other values, the court has come very close to holding that true free speech in Oregon is absolute. Surely, no one who thinks about the question for even a moment believes that any civil liberty can be absolute. Whatever my civil rights are in some abstract state of nature, they become limited the minute I step into a society and meet you. Thinkers like John Stuart Mill, Edmund Burke, John Locke, and James Madison have all made this point. Freedom of speech, religion, property, none of these liberties is or can be absolute. There is no such thing as an absolute civil right. This is why we have stoplights. We know this by legal tradition as well as intuition. I cannot speak an untrue thing about you, we call this slander. You cannot tell a lie to a jury, we call this perjury. The town eccentric cannot walk around naked, we call this public indecency. None of us can yell fire in a crowded theater, we call this yelling fire in a crowded theater. <laughs> but notice that the discussions of free speech are never done in a vacuum. They are always in the context of some perceived political urgency. In wartime, we are willing to silence the enemy in our midst, real or perceived. Conservatives and some women's groups are prepared to restrict the free expression of the pornographers in favor of protecting social morality or the dignity of women. Some liberals want to limit inflammatory hate speech for the greater good of protecting political minorities. The point is, if the stakes are high, we are always and instinctively willing to limit free expression. This is our common sense. Which brings me to the third topic, which is where and how should we draw the lines? Now, I had planned to lay out a few of the main historic ideas, uh, but I am way behind on time. So I will simply say 
that one school of thought, Edmund Burke and his followers, usually the conservatives, had one idea. John Stuart Mill and his followers, usually the liberals, had another, and postmodernists yet another. The point is, if I had laid all these out before you, you would have seen two things. First, all of these approaches assume that there are some limits to free speech. Even the more radical libertarian approaches do not posit absolute free speech. But secondly, you would have realized that in Oregon, none of these options are options. These schools of thought are permanently closed to us. However much we might like to redraw the lines, we can't. According to our high court, there are no content-based limits and there is no balancing when freedom of expression is at issue, end of sentence, full stop. The court has said it won't balance interests and so the people through their legislative bodies can't balance interests. If we want to get at cash in campaigns or eyesore advertising or pernicious pornography, we can't. Our collective hands are tied, we are powerless. No wonder the populists of the right and the left wail and gnash their teeth and rend their garments and call down the wrath of the gods upon the entire regime. They believe they have been comprehensively disenfranchised. I, my time is up. I had some more remarks. I will try and work them into rebuttal or uh, question and answer. Thank you. The question before us this afternoon is not what we think the Oregon Constitution should say. The question is what it does say. As new state constitutions were being formed in the early days of the 19th century, moving from the Atlantic coast across the Appalachians through the Ohio Valley and Midwest onto the Pacific states, the pattern was very clear. The pattern was to make the Bill of Rights in these new constitutions more explicit and more protective of individual liberties than the federal civil rights had been, uh, the federal Bill of Rights had been. And Oregon followed that pattern when our Constitutional Convention met in Salem in 1857. Many changes have taken place since our fathers first formed constitutions, one delegate said. A great many things used to be considered right, which subsequent experience and the progress of the age have taught us our blots upon our national escutcheon. The delegates agreed with that point of view, and they agreed that the, Indiana, the Indiana's new Bill of Rights, which had been uh, adopted just six years earlier, represented the best of this progress in the previous 70 years. And so they copied the Indiana Free Speech Clause verbatim, precisely because it was more protective of free speech than the language of the First Amendment. The language of our clause is in your bulletin today, if any of you have it with you. No law shall be passed restraining the free expression of opinion or restricting the right to speak, write, or print freely on any subject whatever, but every person shall be responsible for the abuse of this right. Now there is no indication in the surviving records of the Constitutional Conventions whether the delegates discussed the meaning of that phrase, any subject whatever. But it doesn't matter whether they discussed it or not because the words could not be more clear, they could not be more plain, they could not be less ambiguous. Any subject whatever means just what it says. And it means that government cannot restrict speech simply because it deals with a subject that one group of legislators deems to be offensive uh, or problematic. Now you might think that constitutional legal scholars would support that conclusion. Co conservative legal scholars usually argue that the Constitution is to be applied as written, not as we would like it to be written. That's a pretty well-established principle of constitutional law, in fact. The U.S. Supreme Court, as early as 1824, a quarter century before our Constitution was written, the U.S. Supreme Court said that the authors of the federal Constitution must be understood to have intended what they said. So, when the framers of the Oregon Constitution met in 1857 and said that the Oregon Constitution will protect speech on any subject whatever, they meant what they said. Any subject means just that. Any subject A to Z. Politics and religion, of course, but also shoes and ships and sealing wax and cabbages and sex. Now that doesn't mean that anything goes in Oregon. The Oregon Constitution protects liberty not license. It guarantees freedom of speech, but it goes on to say that every person shall be responsible for
for the abuse of this right. One kind of abuse occurs when speech is used to commit a crime. Hand me your wallet. This is a stick up. Or when speech is used to inflict injury on a person by slander or libel, as Kelly mentioned, a false statement that Joe is an embezzler, for example. Or when speech is used to commit fraud. Let me sell you this car. It's got 1,000 miles on it, when in fact it has 50,000 miles on it. Crimes and personal injuries of that nature can be, often are, committed by words alone. And that kind of speech is not protected by the state constitution or by the federal. It's also an abuse of free speech to speak in the wrong time at the wrong place. Here too, the state and federal free speech clauses are basically the same. You have the right to sing the Star Spangled Banner at the top of your lungs in the middle of Pioneer Courthouse Square at almost any hour of the day or night. But you don't have the right to sing the Star Spangled Banner in the middle of the reading room in the Multnomah County Library. And you don't have the right to sing the Star Spangled Banner on the public sidewalk outside the patient's rooms at Good Samaritan Hospital at 3 in the morning, any more than you have the right to bang a garbage can at those times and those places. Time, place, and manner restrictions on speech are perfectly legitimate under both the state and federal constitutions, as long as they are not aimed at the content of speech. That is, you can ban parades down Broadway for anybody who doesn't have a parade permit, but you can't ban parades just by pro-abortion people, and you can't ban parades just by pro-Republican marchers, for example. The regulations have to be content neutral, but if they are, they can be enforced reasonably across the board to all speech. There's another point on which the Oregon and federal constitutions do not differ, and that's with respect to conduct. The Oregon Supreme Court said as long ago as 1928 that the tongue and the pen are only two of the numerous means of transmitting messages. The buoy in the harbor tells the navigator of the hidden rock without the use of pen or tongue. And so the idea of using the free speech clause to protect expressive conduct is nothing new in Oregon or nationally. Consider the civil rights movement of the 1960s. People sat silently at a table in a segregated public library in Louisiana. People sat silently at a segregated lunch counter at a Woolworths in Montgomery, Alabama. That silent conduct without a word being spoken communicated a message around the world and it was intended to communicate a message. And the US Supreme Court said that conduct was constitutionally protected, not by the Equal Protection Clause, and not by the due process clause, but by the free speech clause, because that conduct was intended to and did in fact convey a message. You can think of dozens of other examples of conduct that conveys a message. Wearing an armband, burning a flag, burning a cross, wearing a ribbon on your lapel to express support for cancer research, standing at attention when the flag passes by, or turning your back on it when the flag passes by. All of those things are conduct. They all express a message. They all are protected by the Oregon and the federal free speech clause. So there are a great many similarities between the federal and the state free speech clauses, but let me comment now on some of the differences. The courts of many states, not just Oregon, have held that their state constitutional free speech guarantees are stronger than those of the First Amendment. Washington to the north, California to the south, Arizona, New York, Colorado, dozens of states have held that same thing. So when the Oregon Supreme Court has held that our state constitution is more protective than the First Amendment on free speech, it's not saying anything out of the ordinary at all. There are four areas in which our court has said that our constitution gives more protection to free speech than the federal constitution. Commercial speech and election-related speech both fully protected under the state constitution, both given limited, lesser protection under the federal. Libel. You can punish libel by punitive damages under the federal constitution, but the Oregon constitution bars punitive damages for, to punish that kind of speech. And finally, fourth and finally, obscenity. Obscene speech is fully protected under the Oregon constitution, not protected at all by the federal. And it is that last area that seems to be troubling to some people. The landmark from decision from the Oregon Supreme Court in this area was not the new dancing decision of last year. The landmark decision came down 19 years ago in 1987 when the court held that the Oregon Constitution protects obscenity. 
The court held that there was no evidence that when the delegates to our Constitutional Convention met in 1857, and they said that the Constitution would protect speech on any subject whatever, there was no evidence that what they really meant was every subject whatever except sex. Our Constitution protects the right to speak, write, and print on any subject whatever, and the court was right to conclude that that phrase includes the subject of sexual activity. Now, the Oregon Constitution, of course, belongs to the people, and it is within the power of the people of this state to amend it. We amend it often, 35 times in the last 10 years alone, if you can believe it. But three times since that obscenity decision was announced in 1987, three times in the last 12 years, in 1994, 96, and 2000, three times there have been constitutional, proposed constitutional amendments on the Oregon ballot that would have restricted or, or overturned that Oregon Supreme Court decision. And three times Oregon voters have said no. Three times, Oregonians have said that the Oregon Supreme Court's interpretation of the free speech clause is okay with us. For Kelly, that may be cause for dismay. For me, it's cause for celebration. But whether you agree or disagree with that result, nobody can deny the fact that the people of this state have had their say on the subject, and they have reaffirmed the principle that Oregonians can speak on any subject, whatever. Thank you. Now, I have two minutes to make a few rebutting remarks. I agree with Charlie that uh, the proper way to look at the uh, article is uh, to start and finish with the language. Um, I note, though, that the, the language, in addition to setting out those ringing affirmations of free expression, also says, every person shall be responsible for the abuse of this right. The second wrong turn that I believe the court has taken is to conclude that that clause is limited to slander and libel. Because over here, you've got the court's notion of historic exceptions by which they include slander and libel. At the very least, the language uh, concerning abuse seems to suggest to me that, that the rest of the language is not intended to be absolute. And when it comes to pure speech, I, I stand by my statement, we have absolute free speech, absolute free speech, no balancing whatsoever. I'm not talking about time, place, and manner restrictions. That, that's not in the definition of absolute free speech, pure speech. And I'm not talking about this very difficult question of historic exceptions. By definition, if something is historically accepted, it wasn't intended to be covered by Article I, Section 8. And I note that most of the controversy surrounding the issue of obscenity, nude dancing, and so on and so forth, uh, isn't about whether it is or is not expression, but it's whether it is or, is or was intended to be covered as a historic exception. And the Court of Appeals, for example, has taken the Supreme Court to task on its history in the Henry case, which Charlie mentioned, uh, and so on and so forth. The question there is not a balancing of interests. The question is, do we intend did it, was it intended, that the sort of obscenity, nude dancing realm, was that intended to be covered by Article I, Section 8, or was it intended to fall within one of these historic exceptions? Uh, but for my money, I look at the language about no person shall be, uh, but, but all persons shall be responsible for the abuse of this right as a hint uh, that the language of Article I, Section 8 does allow for some balancing of interests. And I, I still contend that to the extent the court has concluded otherwise, it's wrong, and that the price to pay is uh, continuing erosion of public confidence in our courts and in our Constitution. The Oregon Supreme Court has been urged many times to adopt a balancing test, not only in the free speech area, but in other areas of constitutional law. And the court has consistently said this. Balancing was done in Salem in 1857. Those are the guys, and they were guys, those are the guys who did the balancing. They decided what was in the Constitution or not. They did the balancing, and they decided which values would be paramount and which values would be absolute. I don't agree with Kelly that the free speech clause of the Oregon Constitution is absolute. The Oregon Supreme Court has said that it is not absolute. It can be abused, free speech can be abused not just in slander and libel, but in the other ways that I mentioned, too. 
fraud and uh, uh, campaign law violations, campaign uh, uh, false statements made in campaigns, and, and there are several other areas. Government can restrict the misuse of speech because of injury it inflicts, but it cannot regulate speech that inflicts no injury. And Kelly does not contend that people engaged in sexual expression are injuring anybody any more than people who are engaged in religious expression. He just, it just, that kind of speech simply offends his sensibilities. But the Oregon framers of the Oregon Constitution said, we're not going to allow government to make restrictions based on the fact that certain kinds of speech may offend somebody's uh, uh, sensibilities. Kelly points to the abuse clause, the last clause, every man, every person shall be uh, 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 responsible for the abuse of this right. I discussed that clause as well. And the Oregon Supreme Court has said that not only the time, place, and manner sorts of things that I talked about, that it is an abuse of the right of free speech to uh, speak loudly in the, in the public library or outside a hospital room or any number of other examples that you can think of. It is also an abuse of free speech to impose, to, to make certain kinds of speech available to minors. The court has said that the government does have the power to restrict uh, access of certain kinds of speech to minors because they said the framers of the Oregon Constitution uh, had that in mind, and, and certainly they did. The, the, the laws that were in effect regarding obscenity in, in 1857 had to do with restrictions on access by minors, and so the court has consistently upheld uh, uh, laws that would restrict uh, minors' access to obscenity and pornography. And with respect to nude dancing, and with respect to the live sex show, I think it is important to remember that the man who promoted the live sex show in Roseburg, who was a subject of the case last year, is in jail. He was in, is in jail because he was convicted of promoting prostitution because of the very show that he was putting on which suggests that you can put on a live sex show in Oregon, but only if you use volunteers. Because what, <laughs> wh why, he, why he is in jail is that he was paying those performers and, and, the, and that turned it into prostitution, namely the exchange of money, uh, the payment of money in exchange for a, for a sex act. One other thing about the Chancanelli decision, the, the live sex act show and the new dancing show. When you go to hear a sermon by Billy Graham, you are expecting to hear a sermon by Billy Graham, and you are expecting your religious sensibilities to be stimulated and to be provoked and to be engaged. And when you go to Mr. Ciancanelli's live sex show in Roseburg, you had to go through two or three closed doors to get in there. You were not expecting to see Billy Graham. <laughs> Nobody wanders by mistake into an adult bookstore. very much, Kelly and Charlie, for your remarks. I have the honor of asking the first question. I will ask a different question of each of the debaters, beginning with Mr. Hinkle. Uh, speaking of Cincinelli, after Cincinelli, how can someone prove an historical exception? And what do you consider the historical exceptions to be at this juncture? Uh, Judge Rosenblum and Kelly Clark both mentioned this historical exception. I did not. In the seminal case, the Robertson case that Kelly talked about, the, court, the Oregon Supreme Court said that if you can prove that there was a, his, a historical exception to free speech that existed in 1857, and you can show that the framers intended to carve that out as an area that would be subject to government regulation, then we will not apply the free speech guarantee to that particular kind of expression. And they said the obvious examples are the kinds of crimes that I mentioned, the crimes that, uh, that can be committed only by speech. No one is contending that you have the right to walk into US National Bank and say, give me your money. I mean, that is not protected speech. That was the kind of historical exception that was well established. The issue in these sex-related cases was whether or not there was a well-established historical exception for obscenity in 1857 
that is access by adults to sexually explicit materials? And the answer to that is no. I mean, believe me when I tell you that people like Kelly Clark and the Attorney General of Oregon have combed the historical record uh, from A to Z to try to find a, a historical exception, and they were unable to find one. The Court of Appeals on which uh, Judge Rosenblum sits in, the, in that court's decision in Chancanelli, the first reported case they could find with respect to any kind of restriction of a, lie, uh, of a stage show, a theatrical production involving sex, was 1875, which was long after the Oregon Constitution was, was adopted. Uh, the fact is that sex has been part of stage productions since the time of Aristophanes in ancient Greece. And you cannot see a production of Romeo and Juliet that is true to the text without understanding that a 13-year-old girl is having sexual relations with her boyfriend. That's what Shakespeare said, I didn't say it. So if you're going to have a, a, uh, a, a my point being that there, there are the well-established historical exceptions point exactly in the opposite direction. There was freedom of access to theatrical productions that involved sexual conduct and sexual expression before the Oregon Constitution uh, was enacted. And the restrictions only came about in the, in the Comstock era when Anthony Comstock was appointed guardian of public morals or some such uh, title in New York City in about 1875. That's when uh, the public first, uh, that's when governments in this country first began having uh, restrictions on sexual expression. It wasn't, it wasn't before that. Thank you, Mr. Hinkle. <laughs> should I say me think, should I say me thinks thou doth protest too much? No, I won't do that. Uh, for Mr. Clark, uh, in this morning's Oregonian, one of the headlines reads, OLCC, again, will try to regulate sex industry. Uh, I asked Susan if this was a plant uh, since we had this uh, uh, event today. Uh, the proposed amendment, in part, strikes out restrictions on lewd activities, it says, defined as containing, quote, lustful, lascivious, or lecherous behavior and adds language prohibiting business owners from allowing unlawful activity in their bars, taverns, and clubs. A comment made by a lawyer uh, in the same article with respect to these proposed rules says the following. He bemoaned the commission's insistence that it continue to regulate the industry. I don't think they need to be sniffing around in these businesses and looking at conduct that's arguably expressive, he said. They shouldn't be in the business of regulating morality or expression. Mr. Clark, please comment. Well, I actually agree with that. Um, but what I think they can be in the business of is uh, regulating or at least attempting to address the effects uh, of, that, of that behavior. Um, it, the, the business of uh, all the, the sex shows and all that, it, I mean, it doesn't particularly, contrary to Charlie's suggestion, it, it doesn't particularly offend my sensitivities one way or another. What I'm concerned about is that if it continues to offend the sensitivities of a majority of our citizens, if there is a consensus that something has to be done because this is a quality of life issue to them, and if they continue to hear from the courts and the political establishment that we can't touch that, then you've got an erosion of public confidence. The Constitution, above all, has to, be, has to rest on the consent of the governed, and that means as it is interpreted as well. That is my sensitivity. That's my concern. Um, so in, in terms of uh, sniffing around these places and trying to, to get at, uh, at the expression, that's not my concern. I think what the interesting issue is, is when can they prove and not prove a connection between what goes on and the effects. And in several of the, of the new dancing and, and uh, sex cases that we've been discussing, the question is, has there or has there not been shown a connection between this stuff and other stuff out there that is clearly illegal, promotion of prostitution, as Charlie mentioned. Uh, and so that's, that's the more interesting question to me. In, in a very interesting case to me called State versus Stoneman, uh, which was sometime in the mid-90s, it followed State versus Henry. State versus Henry was the one that said basically that, um, that obscenity is not intended to be, uh, it, obscenity is covered by Article I, Section 8, not a historic exception. And the court hinted there that they weren't saying that the legislature couldn't pass laws to protect children. And so we did, and I say we because I was there. 
Uh, in fact, I helped write it. It, was the, it. it criminalized the possession of child pornography defined as a picture or recording of a real child really being abused. And by definition, that's trafficking in the fruits of a crime. And in Stoneman, the court, to its credit, said that law is constitutional because it gets at the effect that we're trying to get at. So, again, I have two concerns when it comes to this whole business of, of, uh, of obscenity pornography and, and, uh, and that whole business. It, one is uh, if, the, if the citizens continue to believe that it's a quality of life problem and their hands are tied, then I think there's a credibility issue. And secondly, we need to always to be able to make the connection between uh, the, effects, the, the effects that we want to try and stamp out and the expression. Once that connection is made, then I think the court has said that the legislation can be passed. Thank you, Mr. Clark. A privilege of uh, membership of City Club is to, be able to, is to ask questions of the speakers. Uh, your question should be no more than 30 seconds and end with a question mark. We will start with a question from our board host, Don Williams. Don is president-elect of the City Club of Portland. He's the chief operating officer of the law firm Schwabe, Williamson & Wyatt. He's been a member of City Club since 1972, has served on two research boards and twice on the Board of Governors. Don. Thank you. Let's move away for a minute from um, sex shows and new dancing to something that may be a little bit closer to home. And both of you alluded to it in your introductions, and let's talk about billboards for a minute. Uh, billboards have come a long way from the Burma Shave ads, which at least some of us in this room can remember uh, when we took vacations as kids. And sign ordinances can cause controversy from a land use perspective with regulations on size, brightness, and digital imagery. In fact, the FAA has even um, passed a regulation prohibiting obtrusive advertising by objects in orbit. And, um, but I'd like you to address the issue of content and state and federal decisions regarding such things as tobacco ads, signs protesting immigration policy, such as occurred in Denver recently, and the display of religious symbols on billboards. Don, I actually didn't hear the last sentence or two. Can you repeat the actual question? Um, what I want you to do is address the issue of content, uh, restrictions on content of billboards and such things as the display of religious symbols, um, tobacco ads, protests against immigration policy, and restrictions on those, those issues. Well, I, uh, um, interesting question. Um, you know, it, it strikes me that, uh, of course, there are some, some other problems if you have public property being used for display of, of religious messages and things like that. So I'll set, I'll set that aside. What the, what the case last, what, two months ago, three months ago, did was strike down the, the Motorist Act to the extent that it made content-based restrictions on-premises versus off-premises advertising. And it seems to me that, um, and I don't know whether we would want to go this far or not, but it seems to me as so long as you eliminate that distinction, on-premises, off-premises, it doesn't, I mean, you, could, you have choice of two remedies, it seems to me. You can say we're going to restrict all signs equally uh, in, in favor of some greater good, um, traffic, scenery, whatever, whatever the community values, or you could say we're not going to uh, license them or require permits at all, in which case we're going to end up looking like Nevada. And this is one of the examples that I'm talking about where I think the citizens of the state of Oregon will not stand for that. You have two very important values, free speech as a value up against the notion that we like Oregon scenery. We like to be able to drive down the road and not think we're in Nevada. And so uh, if the remedy is uh, content neutral, I don't have a problem with that. And if the remedy is you can't do it, I don't have a problem with that either. Um, assuming, again, and I'm not making the rules here, I'm just saying if that's what the community wants to do, the community ought to be able to do that. Uh, and if you tell the community they can't, uh, then you suffer the consequences that I expressed in my remarks and the things that I, that I worry about in terms of the, the, uh, the ultimate consent of the governed. 
the courts have said with respect to time, place, and manner regulations that most of them are enforceable provided they allow for alternative means of communication. You can't ban a certain kind of speech even if it's content, I mean a certain method of communication even if it's content neutral if there is in fact no other means of communication. So I guess one question would be if people are wanting to speak by means of billboards and all billboards were banned, would there be adequate alternative methods of communication? I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't know the, about a law that would ban all outdoor advertising per se uh, across the country. I think, our, I think both the Oregon and the federal Supreme Court might strike that down. You can certainly limit the number of billboards, I think, consistently with both the state and federal um, uh, constitutions. The newspapers, after all, have the right to have news racks on the downtown sidewalks or on the sidewalks anywhere in the city of Portland. But it is reasonable for the city of Portland to say we're not going to have 50 news racks at this particular corner, you know, because that impedes, uh, impedes the sidewalks. It blocks uh, uh, traffic. It may impede uh, sight lines for drivers and so forth. So there are regulations that can be made about uh, billboards. And perhaps, perhaps, Kelly, even some content-based restrictions on the theory that some billboards are aimed at minors, and I'm thinking of tobacco advertising. Can you ban a tobacco billboard on the theory that it's really aimed or it's going to be seen by 15-year-olds who, uh, who are going to go out and buy cigarettes? And we do have the right to, to regulate messages that go to minors. That's a very difficult question. And I, uh, some questions are best left unlitigated and unanswered, and uh, <laughs> one, one hopes that's one, that's one of them. Chris Smith at the microphone. Thank you. Chris Smith, City Club member. Um, I'm a big advocate of free speech rights, uh, but I have also been a, uh, a longtime observer of the corrosive effect of unlimited campaign contributions uh, on our political process and, and, and trying to balance those two, uh, at least for candidate campaigns, have turned to public campaign financing as a remedy. That remedy doesn't map onto initiative and referendum campaigns terribly well, uh, and it makes me wonder if the right of free speech uh, in that setting doesn't have uh, a complementary obligation of increased discernment by the citizens. Uh, so my question is, are there obligations that go along with the exercise of free speech? Is there uh, an obligation of some discernment on the part of the rest of us? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hinkle, why don't you take the first shot at that? As I said earlier, people choose, I think in large measure, the messages they want to see. I mean, if you want to hear a religious message, you go see Billy Graham. If you want to see a sexually provocative message, you go to an adult bookstore. If you want to hear a political speech, you go hear George Bush or Bill Clinton or whoever your favorite candidate is. So of course we are selective, we are self-editing, we are self-censoring in that sense, and we all, we all have to be. We choose the messages that we want to, uh, we want to receive. With respect to campaign finance regulation, uh, again, the Supreme Court, Oregon Supreme Court has over a, a number of years held that the Oregon, Supreme, uh, the Oregon Constitution protects your right to express yourself politically and to spend as much money as you want on it. If Oregonians don't like that, it's a very easy thing to do to amend our Constitution. As I said, 35 times in the last 10 years our Constitution has been amended. And by golly, if people don't like that particular ruling of the Oregon Supreme Court, it's a relatively easy thing to get it overturned. The people have not voted to overturn it, which indicates to me that they are satisfied with, with that uh, ruling. Thank you. Mr. Clark. You, you know, one of, the, one of the historic schools of thought that I didn't have a chance to get into is that the whole notion first expounded by Burke and uh, continued in this country by people like Russell Kirk and George Will and people like that, that that find the limits of free speech and the purpose of free speech, which they contend to be the protection of public and private virtue. Uh, to that extent, if you accept uh, any portion of that premise, then when it comes to something like campaign finance, purpose as limit means that public virtue matters in the case of campaigns, clean campaigns, clean, clean elections. Um, I, uh, I spent some time studying the, the public, uh, excuse me, the Portland Ordinance, and um, it's, it's got an interesting thesis in it. Uh, and that thesis is that there are some kinds of political speech that are more highly valued than other kinds of political speech. That uh, the candidate is going to get the money that has the volunteer efforts and can go get the, the however many contributions, $5 contributions that you needed, a uh, person that's got a grassroots political network that that candidate 
that kind of speech is somehow more highly valued than a guy who wants to just go out and write a check or get Mr. Moneybucks to write a check for him or her. And uh, under current Supreme Court case law, I don't think that distinction stands. Uh, I think that's a content-based restriction based on the type of political speech. Now, there are those who would vigorously disagree with that. But my, the short answer to my question is yes, uh, that there are obligations that go along with these, uh, these precious liberties. And again, I think that's part of what the clause means in Article 1, Section 8 that says every person shall be responsible for the abuse of this right. At least that's what it could mean. Thank you. Call on Jane Sees. Thank you, Jane Sees, member. Um, could, could you two um, talk a little bit more about this issue of majority and popularity? And I'm, in my mind, I'm going back to um, the olden days when we were working on um, one person, one vote. And I think there was a state, I think it was Colorado, where they actually voted that they weren't going to use one person, one vote. Mountains and trees would count as much. And the court threw it out, saying it didn't matter what the, the majority of the voters thought. It was still a protection of people's rights. And so, I mean, on one side, you're talking about the popularity of nude dancing versus more billboards on highways. It seems to me there's a clash coming there. Would you, um, would you have another fight about that, please? <laughs> or whatever you want to do. <laughs> Call on Mr. Clark to respond first. Um, every time I give remarks like this, I hear um, my old professors, Steve Cantor and Don Ballmer and uh, people like that, uh, wincing because it seems that it would seem to them that I've forgotten the idea that the Constitution uh, is designed in some senses to check the passions of the majority. I haven't actually forgotten that, um, but I'm also reminded of a, of a comment made by Senator Mark Hatfield, who I worked for for a short, short period of time. And as you know, Senator Hatfield was never uh, shy about voting his conscience, uh, consequences be damned. And I had a conversation with him about this one time, about, uh, you know, what's your obligation to follow the will of the people versus to stand on principle? And he said this, he said, well, you know, I'm going to vote my conscience as, as often as I need to. Um, but I'll tell you, if I find that my conscience and the will of the voters depart too many times, too radically, maybe I should find another line of work. Uh, again, his notion that there's got to be an underlying consent of the governed here. And so um, I'm not saying that the... Um, that we simply flip a coin and see what's 51% on any given day. Uh, I'm offering more of a diagnosis, if you will, than a prescription. I continue to be concerned that if the public perceives that they are not, that, that, they, that they have no say in what their constitution means, we have a problem. And if all of this populism makes you nervous, as it did me for a number of years, you might ask yourself what that says about your view of government of, by, and for the people. It was Jefferson, in a brutally frank moment, who said, um, I know of no safe repository of political power but in the hands of the people. And if we think the people not enlightened enough to hold it, the remedy is not to take it from them, but to educate them. Thank you. Mr. Hinkle. Well, I am puzzled by Kelly's uh, repeated uh, references to uh, ignoring the will of the people. As I said in my remarks, the Oregon voters had an opportunity three times in the past 12 years to amend the Oregon Constitution to overturn the obscenity decision, and three times they rejected it. I mean, there's no state in the union where it is easier to amend the Constitution than, than in Oregon. The obligation of the courts is to construe and to apply the language of the, of the Constitution as it is written. And if you don't like it, then by golly, change the Constitution. But don't ask the court to be making these policy decisions. The court is not supposed to be making policy decisions. The court is supposed to apply the policy the decision that was made in 1857. And one of the, the basic policy decision they made was that it is no business of government to, to tell Oregonians what they should read and what they should uh, listen to and what they should hear uh, through the media. Uh, and I think that was a good principle then and it's a good principle now. Kelly Clark has never once called me up and said, Charlie, do you think I should read this book? 
He doesn't want me and my advice on what books he should read. He is perfectly capable of making those decisions for himself. The framers of the Oregon Constitution felt that all Oregonians are capable of making that decision for themselves. Read the books that you choose, not the books that government chooses for you. I am sorry to say that we're out of time and we don't have uh, the time for additional questions. However, if you'd like to continue the discussion, please go to uh, the uh, online citizens blog and um, join in. And we are adjourned. Thank you so much for coming.